Um, good afternoon, everyone. I see folks are still starting to come online. Thank you so much for joining. Um, and a warm welcome to all of our guests as we uh, host our inaugural event for NYU Silver's newly launched center uh, at the school, the Constance and Martin Silver Center on Data Science and Social Equity. Uh, really delighted to see you all and to welcome you from wherever you're coming from to learn about a new center uh, and its vision and its launch. I'm really delighted to hear that we'll shortly be hearing from the center's inaugural director, Associate Dean and Professor Mario Guads here at the Silver School, and then from our colleague uptown at Columbia University School of Social Work, Associate Dean and Professor uh, Desmond Patton, who will, is one of really the leaders in our profession, uh, taking up both the promises and perils of the new era of big data. Um, I think all of you know that NYU Silver has a long history in advancing rigorous knowledge and training to advance practices and strategies and tackle really complex social problems and equities. Uh, and our new center really extends that work by seizing uh, the opportunities of the future. Uh, whether we're fully aware of it or not, of course, uh, we live in an era awash in big data, uh, whether these come from large um, data systems like um, public health system, uh, healthcare, uh, social services, or from private platforms, for example, uh, such as Google or Twitter or uh, Facebook or even phone text or GPS. These massive and complex data are increasingly uh, both available and being leveraged as potential tools for impact and actions. Just for example, if you've been following in the media, recently, just a very salient couple of examples, uh, we're becoming aware of how Instagram uh, uses its own data to drive social traffic to its site. And that's increasingly linked with mental health concerns like anxiety and depression uh, for its young users. Or you may also have read about um, the uh, places like Facebook where their facial recognition technology which leverages big data and artificial intelligence are uh, potentially imperiling its own users. So we're becoming aware of some of the real risks of big data and its use. Um, but there's of course also some examples uh, uh, as the groundbreaking and field shaping fields of studies like the uh, Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, which is in my own field uh, leveraging the big data from the Kaiser Permanente Health System in California to predict a host of uh, all kinds of medical and social outcomes uh, from traumatic experiences early in childhood. And that those findings, those longitudinal findings would not have been possible without leveraging a, a massive data set like that, that health system. Uh, so in the era of new big data, Data science holds potentially profound promise and profound peril uh, to thoughtfully advance equity, uh, to promote uh, evidence-informed, smart interventions that contribute to social well-being and to mental health. And to date, social work, uh, we were talking before we came online here, is really just at the very beginning, I think, of taking hold of this new era of big data. Uh, it's really thanks to, I would say, the um, bold and visionary generosity of our school's patrons, Connie and Marty Silver, that the Silver School will be able to help seize this future to be at the table uh, in data science advances and to shape its directions for the future so that the promises of this new era are most likely to be realized and the perils and risks that it presents will be made apparent and hopefully steered clear for, of. Uh, this past year, uh, Connie and Marty Silver provided one of the largest cash gifts ever to a school of social work to establish at NYU Silver a permanent leadership role in data science and social equity. And this gift uh, not only uh, immediately sets them an endowment to support the new data science center that you're going to hear more about in just a few moments, 
but it also established a, a new endowed professorship and a new uh, artificial intelligence hub at the school's McSilver Institute on Poverty Policy and Research uh, under Professor uh, Michael Lindsay and the Executive Director Michael Lindsay's leadership, who, for example, is already working on developing an artificial intelligence algorithm to identify youth who may be at risk of uh, suicide, uh, which I'm sure you'll learn uh, more about in the coming months. Um, so we're really deeply uh, grateful to the school's uh, generous and visionary patrons to help us achieve and work to achieve breakthroughs in our profession's uh, impact. Uh, so as we launched the new center, we first, uh, among the first things we've done is we've established a new scientific launch committee uh, consisting of the wise and generous leadership and guidance from Silver Professor Emeritus Jim Jackard, uh, Professor, Silver Professor Ramesh Raghavan, and Professor Chuck Cleland at NYU Langone and here at the Silver School, and uh, also uh, our center's inaugural director, uh, Associate Dean for Research at the Silver School, Professor Mario Guads. Uh, so let me just briefly introduce uh, Professor Guads, who will then uh, take over the mic. Uh, Maria herself is a leading scholar whose work is centered on the development and evaluation of potent, innovative, and culturally salient social and behavioral interventions to address racial and ethnic, socioeconomic, and gender health inequities. And Maria has generously and sagaciously led the way with some of the center's first initiatives which I'm sure you'll hear about uh, now. So thank you, Maria, uh, publicly for your leadership, not only as our Associate Dean for Research, but also in leading a very uh, robust and exciting launch for the center. So Maria, would you uh, please take over? Yeah, thank you so much for that introduction, Neil. It's so great to be here with all of you. Thanks for joining us for this very exciting day um, to introduce the center to you. Um, next slide, Amanda, please. So I just want to say briefly, you know, why social work? Why would we locate a data science center um, in a school of social work? We think that there's a lot of really great reasons, and we'll be talking about those today. And social work's a unique uh, profession um, that's informed by practice as well as theory, and it's uh, grounded explicitly in social justice. Uh, we're expert in structural factors that influence health and well-being, qualitative and quantitative methods and we're experts in anti-racism racism and anti-oppression and as we'll be talking about today these issues could not be more important in this new and emerging field of data science next slide so social work i'd say fairly new to data science but there are some uh, leaders including dr patton who'll be speaking with us today and some um, emerging scholarship um, in this area next slide so we've been envisioning the center um, you can see here that harnessing technology for social good is one of the grand challenges for social work that we've taken up um, and where our center is aligned with that mission. But what the way we see the center is elevating social justice and equity in data science, integrating data science into social work research and practice, and promoting innovative scalable solutions to society's biggest problems and training the next generation of social work data sciences. Next slide. So here's our research portfolio at Silver. A little hard to see, but these are the areas that we work in, including mental health services, research poverty, aging, all of which are grounded in um, anti-racism and social justice. Next slide. And we are fortunate to be located in a very rich data science environment at NYU. We have the Center for Data Science, Tandon, Center for Responsible AI, the AI Now Initiative, Center for Urban Science and Progress, and PRISM. We are not operating alone. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. And we've already had a lot of exciting and rich conversations with these leaders at Silver at uh, NYU. And I can say they've been incredibly generous with their expertise and time as we collaborate with them on this endeavor. Next slide. We have some data science at Silver, as um, Dean Guterman was uh, pointing out, we have our AI hub, 
um, some studies on natural language processing, machine learning, big data, and virtual reality. So this is a nice start. Uh, there's some going on now, and we're going to continue to grow it as the center um, moves forward in time. Next slide. One thing we did this summer was um, uh, release two RFPs to the Silver community. Some members of the NYU community are um, engaging this research also. Thank you so much for your support. Um, we appreciate it. And we've made two awards so far, Dr. Chang, um, studying Asian American responses to racism, um, looking at Twitter data, and Dr. Stanhope using natural language processing to um, study person-centered care planning and behavioral health settings. So we're very excited about both of these. And next year we'll have an event and we'll be able to present some findings to you. Next slide. So here's what we'll actually do. Um, our plan is to provide a speaker series. This is our first one. Thank you so much for attending. We'll provide trainings, grant awards I just mentioned, consultations, collaborations within NYU and outside um, NYU and work to engage students um, in data science to prepare them to be the next generation of social work data sciences. Um, so that's, those are my remarks for today. And um, now I would like to introduce our guest speaker. We couldn't be more excited to have Dr. Patton with us here today. He is a senior associate dean for innovation and academic affairs, the founding director of the SAFE Lab, and co-director of the Justice, Equity, and Technology Lab at the Columbia School of Social Work. He's also the associate director for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and the co-chair of the Racial Equity Task Force at the Data Science Institute, and founder of the SIM Ed Tech Incubator at Columbia University. So many titles, I think we're probably finding a new title for him as we speak. In part, his research uses virtual reality to educate youth and policymakers about the way social media can be used against them and how race plays a part in that. And Dr. Patton is a leading pioneer in the field of social work and AI and helping organizations develop an approach to diversity and inclusion that includes fairer, more empath um, empathic practices that address bias and promote equity. We couldn't hope for a better speaker as we envision the center in this um, inaugural event. And uh, Dr. Patton, we're so uh, grateful that you um, are gonna share your thoughts with us today. So let me turn it over to you. Thank you so very much for having me. Um, I am going to attempt to um, share my slides seamlessly. We'll see how bad that goes. One second, please. Okay, can you all see those slides that are working great. Well, it is so wonderful to be with you all and first congratulations on this innovative new center i'm so excited to see a social work school leading in this space, this is a, a very exciting time and congratulations to all of you. So uh, today I want to talk about um, social work thinking as an apparatus for AI design. Um, it is uh, my bias um, that social work be a leader in the development and implementation of ethical emerging technologies, and in particular artificial intelligence. Um, I think that our at the core, our principles, our values, and our mission um, necessitate that we are at the core of this new um, and exciting space. But there are challenges involved um, in this space that I wanna talk through as well. Um, so I'm excited to be with you all. So I had the chance uh, to speak with Greg Epstein. He's a well-known Harvard and MIT chaplain who was on sabbatical as a tech writer for The Crunch. Um, he was investing sto um, investigating stories about the ethics of technology and business. And we spent over an hour discussing my research at the intersections of social media and gun violence and how social work could help in that space. But what I appreciated the most about our conversation was the centering of social work as a transformative discipline and a driver of ethical development of AI technologies, posing a question of a chief social worker in AI space redistributes power 
and reimagines a world where social work thinking and practice and science has the potential to redirect the serious challenges, challenges we're experiencing as technologies sold as for good cause more harm, erode democracy, and exacerbate oppression for those who are most vulnerable. So I believe that social work should be at the forefront of AI technology design, development, and the deployment for real world applications. I posit the idea of social work thinking as an apparatus of social change within the context of AI design. Social work thinking leverages NAS NASW code of ethics, ideas like honoring the dignity and worth of every person, Centering the importance of human relationships and engaging in trustworthy practices anchor how social work thinking can be applied for ethical AI design. Now, and I believe that social work thinking could have been useful in Google's most latest challenges with their facial recognition systems. So here's another example of a tech company uh, trying to do good, but running into lots of barriers because of their blind spots that many are unwilling to contend with in real and powerful ways. And so a couple of years ago, Google wanted to create a racially diverse data set. So the intentions were, you know, theoretically good. And in their attempt, they hired um, temporary individuals to collect facial scans and paid individuals who are experiencing homelessness to be a, a part of collecting those scans. Now, what Google did not do was reflect on the potential challenges of their approach. Number one, they lacked informed consent. Number two, there was no discussion of confidentiality. Where are these facial scans going? Who was affected and why? and any kind of direct concern for the general well-being of the participants. So what does it mean for individuals who are experiencing homelessness to be a part of collecting facial scans? What are the conversations around surveillance that need to be had, around the, the, the misuse and abuse of power in this situation? Again, this is a clear and demonstrable role for social work to be the blind spotters that are, that, that, that are clearly missing in technology spaces. So over the past few years, it has become popular to pursue AI for good. You know, engaging in ideas that suggest that solving longstanding social problems with diverse community members uh, with AI could be the, the way to approach um, um, hard to reach communities that our traditional research methods have not allowed. So academic institutions and technology oftentimes partnering together have invested vast resources in using AI to deepen our understanding of how society works with goals like improving well-being and creating more technologies that work for all. This is supposedly a good thing. But if you take a look at the websites of organizations, you probably are gonna have a hard time finding individuals that represent the diversity and complicated lived experiences that we all know to be true as social workers. So according to AI Now, 18% of authors at leading AI conferences are women and more than 80% of AI professors are men. The numbers are more dire with respect to race. At Google, only 2.5% of, of the workforce is Black. And we also experienced the, 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 the uh, blowback of Timmy Gabru, who alerted us all to the challenging practices at Google. So we see what happens when there's Black leadership within AI companies. And at Facebook and Microsoft, both have held steadily at around 4%. So the lack of inclusion within and around AI spaces may also explain how racism becomes baked into algorithmic code. Sociologist Dr. Ruha Benjamin of Princeton University defines what she has labeled the new gem code as the perpetuation of racial hierarchies through the means of technology and algorithms. She argues that the same biases that exist outside of technology are being implicitly coded into emerging software, thereby explicitly perpetuating racist behaviors. One clear-cut example of this is the use of facial recognition systems within the policing system. I want to introduce you to Robert Williams from Farmington Hills, Michigan, who worked at an automatic supply company. On a Thursday afternoon, he received a call from the Detroit Police Department telling him to come home to the station to be, to come home, to, to come to the station to be arrested. An hour later, he was arrested at his home. The police wouldn't tell him why he was being arrested, but rather showed him a photo with the words felony, warrant, and larceny. 
Robert was then taken to a, a detention center where he was booked and held overnight. The next day, he was taken to an integration room and questioned about the last time he was at the Shinola store in Detroit. Police showed a still image from the surveillance video showing a heavyset man dressed in black and wearing a red St. Louis Cardinal cap standing in front of the watch display. The second piece of paper was a close up. The photo was blurry, but it was clearly not Mr. Williams. So Mr. Williams was actually arrested um, in front of his family. He had to then come home to his daughter and his family and to explain to him why he was arrested. So the impact of this faulty facial recognition system is not just about his individual experience, which is also harmful, which is also detrimental and something that black men in America experience all too often. But the ripple effects also affected, affected his family, affected his daughter. And this built-in memory will continue to be a lasting effect. Again, this is a, another space where social workers need to be thinking very critically about their role. It's not necessarily a role for design, but also perhaps a role for advocacy, also a role for critical social work as well. So I think that we should be concerned about the lack of voices, a lack of expertise and experiences, particularly of folks from who are Black, Latin, and Native American within our particular context. We need folks from all social socioeconomic classes and individuals with less than a college degree or past justice involvement or practitioners and first-line workers. These folks are not actively involved in AI development technology. So we have to take a step back and think how might AI impact society in a more positive way if these communities were consulted often, paid as experts, and recognized as integral to the development and integration of these technologies that aim to improve life for all. So in my lab, the Safe Lab, we are trying our very best to do better. We are a transdisciplinary space. We are social workers and computer scientists and engineers, psychology undergraduate students, uh, public health practitioner, nurses and community members. And we have been attempting to look at social media as the new neighborhood, as an environmental context of study in which behavior and engagement is paramount we need, and that we need to understand for the, under, for the development of new tools and interventions that can help reduce and ameliorate our most pressing social ills and, and challenges. Now, in the SAFE Lab, we spend an enormous amount of time trying to understand the problem. And we do that through the annotation of social media data. And this is pretty complicated because then a computer science and data science based annotation is used as a binary classification tool to identify you know, sentiment, positive or negative sentiment and to lump things into very distilled spaces. But what we do is to bring in qualitative methodologies and social work thinking to really disrupt the process and to understand how context is at play, to understand nuance, to understand backstory that helps us to then label data in a very thoughtful and critical, critically reflexive way to unpack meaning and hopefully new definitions of the problem. And so in the SAFE lab, we use an inductive close read, which is a qualitative strategy to determine what social media expressions relate to expressions of things like loss and grief and aggression. Our particular focus has been on uh, issues of gun-related violence. We also have, have extended that to look at issues of trauma and loss and grief as an area of study. Uh, we specifically hired social work students as annotators to carry out these tasks. What we've learned is that this annotation process is the space where data science can slow down and that we can take time to thoughtfully train annotators and reflexive practices and social work thinking so that they can bring in their lived experience and their insights to the labeling of social media data because when that, when that data is mislabeled and misinterpreted, the consequences, particularly for those most, most vulnerable, are quite dire. We make sure that our annotators have an understanding of the domain for which they're working in. And we wanna make sure that they understand their tasks and the purpose of what they're doing. They go through um, a pretty in-depth two week um, tutorial on our process. I'm gonna walk you through some of that in a few minutes. 
they spend a week long immersion before they touch any data they are immersed in a set a, a set aside corpus for which they can can make mistakes they can get feedback so that so that we're not so that we're taking into consideration the lives of the people that we're reviewing and so that they have enough time there's always need for more time that they at least have time to get feedback and to process their their um, interpretation of social media posts and they continue to practice that over time and so that close interaction in, in the annotation space is then is in a part of the process of, in, in which we label data that is then handed off to our computer science colleagues. Uh, we've had the good fortune of working with uh, the former director of the Data Science Institute, Kathy McEwen, and the current NCHM Dean, uh, Shifu, Chi, Shifu Chang. Kathy is an expert in natural language processing, and Shifu is an expert in computer vision. So this work has been applied to uh, my study of Jakaira Barnes. Um, some of you may have heard me talk about Jakaira. She has been a transformative voice in my, in, my, in my personal and professional life. I encountered her in this very article in 2014. Uh, she was murdered April 11, 2014, just steps from her house in the Woodlawn neighborhood of Chicago, which is just a few blocks from where I was uh, getting my PhD at the University of Chicago. This tagline is what stayed with me. And unfortunately, is my first attempt to understand Jakaira. So as you might imagine, the Chicago's gun toting gang girl reduces Jakaira to a very, very negative version of herself. It gives you nothing about her childhood or about her pain or about her family, about who she loved to care about. It took, it scraped all of the attributes and characteristics of who she was. And that became a part of my own imbibing of white toxicity and how I labeled and how I viewed Jakaira and the types of research questions that we've been asked of her. So again, being very careful about the ways in which media shapes narrative, both, as, both in terms of how you develop research questions and how you analyze data and how you move forward with your research. These images also became a part of how I viewed her. And so when in our initial look at Jakaira, we were looking for aggression. We wanted to see what would happen to her friends within her Twitter network. Would they retaliate against individuals that would perhaps proclaim to be associated with her death? And so because of that initial imbibing of the narrative how we viewed her, the questions that I asked of her, well, we found aggression and we found threatening behavior. But what Jakaira did in death was force me to reckon with her humanity, force me to ask deeper questions about who she was, who her family was, who her friends were, what her life was like. And then we saw much more. We saw a young black girl who had experienced more grief than probably any of us would ever experience in a lifetime who experienced so much pain and was readily calling out on Twitter day in and day out, but yet so focused on aggression and threats, we overlooked this young individual who was also calling out for her. Again, another opportunity for social work involvement, for social work engagement, but if you're not deeply embedded in the work, if you're not looking, if you're not reflexive, you will miss these really clear digital signs of loss and grief. But critical to that work and in our ability to do that is to hire domain experts and to work with young people who are from the community. So as a lab, as social work scientists, we recognize our lack of knowledge regarding the hyperlocal language and broader context surrounding Jakaira's tweets and individuals who were embedded in her life. The risk is that we run misinterpreting a tweet and over identifying innocuous language as being threatening. So our solution was to create an annotation process in which the validation of our findings of our annotation would have to go against what our domain experts would see. We held the interpretation and experience of domain experts over what we saw as annotators. We wanted to create a process where their, where their insights were valued over our own insights. It was also important that we hire young people as research assistants, paying them the same rate that we would pay a master's student in our lab because their work was exper is expertise. Their work is as important as a master's student at Columbia School of Social Work. 
And so we worked with young Black youth, both boys and girls, men and women. Our goal was to get a robust understanding of context, including hyperlocal language, to get that backstory that oftentimes is missing and are hard to get when you're quickly looking at social media posts. But there's lots of challenges. You know, oftentimes people get really excited about inviting young people into the lab, but we made lots of mistakes in this space. Um, our young people had lives well outside of academic research and when life happened, they had to attend to their personal needs. And so our schedules, our calendars did not match up. And so we had to realize that and reimagine how we would conduct a relationship that would be mutually beneficial. A part of that was to develop a mentoring system with community partners who could work with our domain experts under conditions that work best for their lives, not for our own. And so together, we were able to create a methodology that did just that, that would really honor, really honor the interpretation and the nuance and the backstories. And so we created CASM, which is the contextual analysis of social media approach. Now, CASM is a methodological process that focuses on contextually driven and domain specific decisions to labeling social media for the training of algorithmic systems. So we created CASM to serve as a method to bridge the identified gap between inadequacies in current language processing tools and differences in geographic, cultural, and age-related variants of social media use and communication. Most importantly, CASM focuses on utilizing a transdisciplinary team, a team-based approach to an annotating and qualitatively analyzing social media data explicitly grounded by deep community expertise and understanding. This process yields rich quality analysis as well as in-depth annotations that can then be passed off to our natural language processing teams. But embedded in that approach is a reflexiveness of understanding, is this the right approach? Is having the most accurate natural language processing tools the right goal when applied to this particular domain? What does it mean to have an accurate natural language processing tool that is good at analyzing Black language? Is that helpful or harmful? A part of that process was to create an annotation system. This is Vetas. If you're interested in using Vetas and want to learn more, more, uh, more about Vetas, this is a citation for it. But the goal was to create an annotation system that felt like social media, that felt like you were on Twitter. I'm going to walk you through, I'll go through a really quick demo of what that looks like. So this is Vetas, and this is um, what an annotator would be presented with. Um, you would get a tweet. This tweet comes from a larger corpus of data. We were able to collect over a million tweets from Jakira and her network. We um, use a snowballing technique to identify 279 users that had the most mentions and replies with Jakira. That, and then we labeled 5,000 of those tweets, hand labeled, and then we had uh, over a, a million tweets that were unlabeled. And so in this particular case, an annotator is, is given the post and we wanna get a baseline interpretation without having any context. And so the post says, I've been up for like three days straight. And the um, annotator says, well, he hasn't slept in days. Well, that's not really useful or helpful. So then we ask the annotator to go through a step-by-step -step procedure to look for context, to look at the post, to solicit web-based resources like Hip Hop Wiki, to look at the author, to look at the peer network you know, individual can, can say that, proclaim that they're um, gang involved, but then following Disney characters, that discontinuity there. Looking at the offline events became critically important because offline events help, to in, in, help us to in, inform our interpretation of posts. So a, a, a church or a school or a sidewalk or an intersection can have deeper meaning that can then influence how we should be interpreting those posts. We look at the virality of posts and the engagement among users around a particular post. Now, after the annotator has gone through those set of procedures, they now have a lot more to say. So now the annotator at this point is saying the user hasn't slept for three days. And then he says, this post comes days after his friend was killed. This user may have, be, may have difficulty sleeping because of his friend's death. This aspect of death and sleeping was not something that the annotator originally surmised. And so being able to induce bring in and induce more context, allow for a fuller representation of what may actually be happening in the post. And so the goal has then always been to then provide these classifications. The most critical and challenging part about being a social worker in data science space is this need to lump critically important human behavior into very small boxes of data. 
And so the most predominant things qualitatively that came out of Jakaira's work were grief and aggression and all these other important uh, behaviors like social behavior and mood and status and relationships were lumped as other. But before we hand off um, our data to our NLP and computer vision colleagues, we then go back to those domain experts. Again, we want to make sure that they, that we're seeing eye to eye in terms of our interpretations. And then we're also studying disagreement because oftentimes the, uh, the, the domain, the domain um, experts would have a different backstory understanding that our annotators would not have. And then being able to privilege the annotation of the domain experts over the annotators and the, in my lab. And so we wanted to test whether or not chasm is actually a helpful approach. And so what we did was we, uh, we had a test set and we trained a model based on hand labels. This is the annotation versus the distant model, unlabeled data. When the system um, had hand labeled data, its ability to accurately identify aggression and loss was much better. It was around 64% versus on the distant label or the unlabeled data, which is around 52%. And so having more context was better for having a more accurate model. But again, this chasm process forced us to reckon with, do we, do we still want this though? Are we aiming for 100% accuracy? Is that actually going to help young people like Jakaira stay safe? Would that have helped Jakaira stay safe? And that question looms over the work. And so I think, you know, this question around can AI keep young people safe was one that we constantly go back and forth in our lab. I think some of the advantages that we've learned is that I think that it could aid social workers and violence outreach workers in their intervention work by helping to identify root causes of conflict. There's lots of conversations and lots of challenging situations that are discussed within the social media neighborhood and being able to identify and understanding the connections between events is really helpful. I think the AI can help us solve, solve longstanding social problems with, diversity, with the diverse community members that were at some point really hard to do with our traditional qualitative and quantitative methods. But at the same time, we know that we can enact different levels of state violence by enacting surveilling, but by surveilling the hyperlocal language and pictures of social media that can be used as evidence or negative character, character testimony within the criminal justice system. So I believe that it is time for social work to be engaged in, in, in translational computational social work. Ren et al. posit the need for computational social welfare. They define this space as a powerful new science that combines a focal commitment to social justice and equity with the adoption of computational modeling as an epistemological paradigm with advanced data science skills as a methodology. Now, I would like to advance their idea by suggesting that the work also be translational, that the work we produce moves beyond using AI and data science for the sake of saying so, that at its core, the work produces meaningful ideas, results, and processes that consider issues of power, race, oppression, and privilege that then directly benefit all humankind. At its core, I think translational computational social work is transdisciplinary. This work is inclusive of true community partnerships that we imagined who was an expert. I think the work then offers the best of social work thinking and science and practice to reduce and hopefully eradicate our most pressing social problems. I think we do this by asking ourselves reflective questions, by thinking about the respect and privacy and the dignity of our subjects, of individuals that we're working with in our communities, that our goal is always to do the least amount of harm possible, and to always center inclusivity and in onboarding participants who have a stake in the future of AI development. I think as social workers, we understand and know that we should be engaged in a reflective approach with the design of algorithmic tools. We deal with complexities and real world problems every day. And I think adopting reflexivity as a principle in AI development helps us to engage in processes that center those voices, that help us to think about the specific nuance and, and local expertise that could be the blind spotting mechanism that is so needed in this space. I think we have to redefine and reimagine expertise in AI. So who are we going to look for when developing our teams, when developing our new centers, and when analyzing our findings and disseminating our work? I think that when we respect and value diverse lived experiences, we create an opportunity to anticipate needs rather than simply responding to them after a crisis. 
I think centering all lived experiences offers a holistic way to move beyond classifying human behavior into neat bins of data that forcing us to consider who overall gets to participate in UX and AI design and how data is collected and analyzed and the ways in which those systems are deployed and most important for whose benefit. So just some general reflections that I wanna leave you with. Is AI the right tool for the question? I think that that, that needs considerable conversation. Are you engaging in extensive and critical conversations with communities as you're developing AI tools? And how are you developing true partnerships? What does it mean to develop true partnerships to better understand the, how the problem is defined by the community? Uh, I wanna lift up the work of uh, my friend, Laura Neeson uh, from Portland State, who has been doing lots of deep, uh, uh, lots of deep thinking in, ar ar around the future of social work. And she poses lots of questions for us that I think that I wanna, that I wanna leave you with. How is the AI discussed within the context of social work? What narratives and counter narratives are advanced in this space? How can we use social work thinking to advance ethical AI design for social good? What does human behavior in the social environment mean in the context of AI? And how will social work shape the future of AI and vice versa? Thank you so much. It's been wonderful to be with you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Patton. We really appreciate it. I see some questions coming in um, in the chat, and we'll also take questions if people want to um, raise their hands. So far, I don't see too many people on the screen, but we can start with the, uh, the questions in the chat. So I don't know if you can see them, but one question asks, I was wondering whether these approaches have been applied to gun violence by white youth. Seems just as important given all we know. For example, might we have been able to predict the behavior of Mr. Rittenhouse? I love this question. Thank you so much. In my theoretical work, I have been studying um, digital racism and policing and pose the same question. You know, just a few blocks from Columbia Social Work, there was a large gang uh, sweep uh, based on um, affiliations in uh, Facebook images. And those individuals, 100, 304 of them, were surveilled for months. Whereas folks like Mr. Rittenhouse and other white mass murderers um, were only, their social media accounts were only reviewed post hoc. So they were able and left up to kill and to murder. And then their, then their social media um, conversations were then brought in after the fact. Again, this, this, this type of surveillance, this type of um, state violence is a real concern. And this is really um, the work that has pushed uh, by Dr. Benjamin um, out of Princeton, who in her theoretical thinking forces us to think about the gaze and where and, and, and where this gaze is going and who's engaging in the gaze. Um, so yes, that, that is a really important question. Can we stay on your Twitter study for a second? Um, I have a question. Just um, well, I wonder if, you know, there seems to be tension between the qualitative and very labor intensive aspect of the domain experts and the desire of AI to be unsupervised, cheap, and fast. So do you want to talk about that tension and, and sort of how you see it potentially being resolved or not resolved? I think that this is the perfect conversation for social work. Um, I experienced that tension, but the work requires that we slow down. And I think there is no other response because the consequences for the communities that we're working with are so dire. If we do not get this right, if we do not understand context, if we do not understand the ways in which different youth express themselves on social media, then we are gonna be missing the problem. We don't have a full understanding of the problem. And we have the, our, we have the gross and, 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 and ch challenging our um, experience of recreating new problems of um, expanding the surveillance state within this social media environment. And there's already lots of conversations around the role of social, uh, social work in surveillance of black communities through child welfare and other systems. Understanding that replication in social media and technology is something that we need to be diving deeper into. And so for me uh, and, and for my computer science colleagues, I think that they understand they need to slow down. We started off with a very small study of Takira's data. We were looking at just a thousand tweets, for example. And the reality is that none of the gold standard techniques or tools worked. They consistently uh, misunderstood the language. They were not empathetic. They missed context. 
we had I had to have the awkward conversation of explaining to my computer science colleagues that the N word has a different meaning within the black community and that this AI system that consistently labels it as being negative or threatening is problematic. Thank you so much for that. So just to continue on this point, do you do you get pushback um, regarding your approach um, of integrating um, content experts and um, this labor intensive qualitative approach integrated with AI? Um, folks ask really important questions around the young people that are involved. Do they wanna be involved? Do they benefit from this? Are they potentially harmed by this? And I always really appreciate those questions um, because it, it, it should be top of mind for us. Um, what I didn't get a chance to really talk about is our process for engaging young people. And so we work with trusted community partners to help broker those relationships. My first connection to this was through um, Eddie Bocanegra, who I'm sure uh, Neil knows from uh, from Chicago, who was my entry point to meeting with young people. And before I met a single young person, we spent an hour and a half on the phone with him drilling me about the purpose of my work, why am I doing this work, and how these, and why these young people would benefit from that. And I immensely appreciated that because it was very clear that he wasn't just going to let some researcher come in and exploit his young people. And I think that is really the value that having that trusted broker brings to this particular space. And so, and all along the way, I was constantly checking in and asking folks that work with Eddie and asking Eddie about the correct ways in which to engage this work. But then young people have their own voices as well. And the young people that I work with wanted to keep their community safe as well. They wanted to participate. They wanted the involvement. They wanted the, um, um, the research experience to, to better prepare their own lives for careers in research. And so that, that for me has been some of the, the pushback that I've received, but we've been able to think through that with community partners and with the young people as well. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I guess just to highlight, it's a little, what you're presenting is a different, a little bit of a different framework on sort of this automated AI uh, type of work, which is why we invited you, so thank you. <laughs> um, there's a question, going back to my presentation, how broad is the definition of big data with large national longitudinal data sets be included? Many in the field are well versed with such data. I personally would say that those large data sets are not big data. Big data tends to be large and unstructured and typically we don't use our regular stat software packages to analyze them they require some kind of super supercomputing environment so i would say that the large national data sets aren't um, big data that said they can be data science studies so for example if you use a machine learning approach or dr patton do you want to say ways that um, large data sets could be um, fall under the umbrella of data science even if they're not big data yeah, it's all about the study of language, right? And so, again, we use a machine learning approach to study 800 posts on Twitter. Not a big data approach at all, but definitely a data science approach. What I appreciated about my, my collaborations with data scientists was that we actually scaled up along the way. So we did not start with a big data approach. I'm not saying that you can't start a big data approach. We actually started with more of a, a thick data qualitative approach to understand the problem and to understand the challenges with the application of machine learning for this particular um, use case. And then over time, we scaled up and engaged in different experiments to see to what extent using more data and having more context is gonna be going to be more helpful in having the most accurate system. But again, that question that I think we should all be asking ourselves is, what does it mean to get scaled up and to have an accurate system? And in some spaces, I think that's, that is totally fine to be the case. Um, but especially in social work, asking and perhaps requiring these reflective questions as a part of our, uh, of our research process, I think it's going to be really important. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question. Thank you, Dr. Patton, for this wonderful talk. Can you talk about some of the social work practice, theoretical, and or policy implications from this important work? Well, I think we have to be at the table, right? So one of the things that I'm thinking a lot about is, I'm sorry, uh, the metaverse. And what does it mean for us to be thinking about our world as a virtual world and, that, and, and being able to have on a pair of glasses that connects you to a virtual reality space where you can order whatever you want, right? So what does it mean for social workers to be thinking and anticipating some of these challenges? 
in the lab, we have been thinking a lot about tech policy as it relates to digital policing and really trying to push for a reimagining of what these tools can be in criminal justice spaces. I have long thought that we spend too much time thinking about threatening behavior and aggressive and punitive behavior as opposed to real problems and the reasons why people come to social media and technology in the first place. But again, if we're not at the table, that conversation is moving and, and, and it's being led by folks who are not actively engaged with human beings on a day-to-day -day basis. And I see it time and time again, where I am usually one or two, you know, I, I think I saw Eric Rice, you know, we're the, we're the only folks at Facebook and at Twitter and at uh, Microsoft having these conversations. And that that is a problem. So I'm like, super excited about this center and, uh, and about the need to be training the future of social workers who are 21st century social workers, I think, in this space. But what that also means is that I don't think we all need to leave with data science skill, meaning being able to code or being able to um, write a script that's gonna lead to some facial recognition thing. I think a part of it is about translation of these ideas, about anticipating challenges and problems, about ethics, right? Folks are hiring ph philosophers to be ethicists in this space. Why not social workers? There's lots of opportunity and lots of entry points that I hope we all engage in as well. Okay, thank you. Some questions coming in. One is given social desirability bias, cloaking effects where people behave more badly in anonymous settings, et cetera, how do you enhance the validity of social media posts? That's essentially why I think you have to have demand expertise in this space, right? And so it's been wonderful. I'm working on a, on a project with the mayor's office where we're trying to create a tool that um, um, hopefully induces some trustworthiness between NYCHA residents and the mayor's office through analyzing social media data. So we're analyzing posts that um, NYCHA residents are directing um, towards the city about environmental conditions, about uh, uh, safety, and then we also have a community engagement component where we are engaged in um, 75 interviews with NYCHA residents and a community advisory board. And so oftentimes being able to uh, check the finding from the sentiment analysis vis-a-vis -vis the quality of analysis has been a really important point because something sometimes things just don't add up but being able to have that deep and rich voice to validate what we're seeing on social media has been a, a really important contribution to our work okay so you're saying again that the um ai approach or the nlp approach can, does not necessarily stand alone I, I don't think that it should stand alone, particularly within the context of studying human behavior. I think that that's where we run lots of risk. And it, it doesn't have to be that way. There are lots of folks that want to be engaged in this space. And I think if we understand and, and understand that lived experience as expertise, then you will value that expertise over the AI tool that you use to study the problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Another question. This is a wonderful talk, exclamation point. Uh, in your experience, what have been some of the practices that have worked for you to bring social work researchers and social workers into data science work? I love this question. So Courtney Codberg and I, we created a data science minor at Columbia Social Work. Introducing the topic is the first place to start. And so over the last few years, we've been able to train 20 students in year one, 30 students in year two, offering different coursework that you know first introduces the conversation. There's lots of folks that are, you know, adjacent to technology or interested and curious, but don't really understand how to jump into it. And so understanding that technology is a social work imperative is kind of is, is a reimagining of what social work can be. And so I think that this is what the opportunity of your center um, can offer. Excellent. Thank you. A uh, few questions for Dr. Patton and or the center leaders. Um, how can faculty be involved in the center? Are there training and other collaboration opportunities? Um, so I'll take that, Dr. Patton, since you're our guest. Um, well, if you're in, if the easiest answer is, um, and Amanda, you can help me out here, if you're NYU faculty, we'll be having more events. Um, we're actually talking to Dr. Rice about coming in next semester, and he's on the call. So thank Eric, thank you so much for being here today. And um, possibly, um, trainings that uh, NYU faculty and perhaps others um, 
will be available too. So we have a website. And Amanda, can you think of other ways for us to stay engaged with people? We have a Twitter account. What, what are some other ways we can continue to push out to interested parties about what our offerings? Yeah, I'll drop some things in the chat, some information, our um, email address and the website. Um, but we really want to hear from the community, from the silver community, what is wanted and needed. Um, and we're really excited. I think, Dr. Patton, you're giving us so many ideas about um, directions that we can take. And your work is so inspiring and important. Thanks, Amanda. I appreciate that. Um, another question. It's also fascinating. Thinking down the line, how can we ensure that traditional methods, such as qualitative accounts of lived experience, experiences aren't overshadowed or decentered mm. if it moves in the in this direction? What might be some unintended or unforeseen consequences we should be mindful of? Yeah, that's such a good point. And I really appreciate it. I'm I am a qualitative methodologist and my excitement about being in data science space has been to be a qualitative person in data science space. And so I think that it's really important to maintain that integrity of identity, um, of methodology, to bring forth the most rigorous methods, the qualitative methods in the data science space, and not shrinking in that space. Um, what I what I oftentimes see is, you know, the social scientists or the qualitative methodologists becoming a smaller component of a data science study without arguing for the need of qualitative methods in this space for the diversity of thought, for inducing testable hypotheses, for validating things that we see um, in machine learning and computer vision techniques and tools. So I think making sure that you're not diminishing the importance of the method and that the that the, the question is driving the method i think will remain to be true um and that's um that has worked for me um in these data science spaces okay thank you um one of our doctoral students uh dr Patton, really wonderful presentation and exciting new directions for the field given the scale of data use for ai development and limited resources in our field how do you foresee the social workers navigating the use data that may have been collected unethically by large tech organizations for social good? Yeah, that is a really important question. Um, and I, I don't I don't fully know, um, I, but I think a part of the what I have experienced in my work over the last 10 years or so is that it's, that it's usually not always clear how data were collected and if that should be a question in terms of how we pursue analyzing that data. And so a part of it is becoming aware of data collection methods, challenging those methods. And I think also there's plenty of space and room for folks to collect their own data, right? And so I think that having alternative avenues um, and pursuing colleagues within these spaces that are that are that are very much focused uh, on ethical ethical data collection strategies is gonna be really important. I've been able to collaborate with folks at Facebook, at Twitter, um, at Spotify, um, by identifying folks who have similar core values. And so the, there is this kind of this dominant narrative that these companies are just, you know, the devil and that everyone that works here is the devil. And that's not necessarily true. I think there are lots of folks within these, within these spaces that want to do the right thing and are engaged in ethical practices. I think finding your network and finding your community in, in this space is really important. So I, and that's why I think like, things like this are really important because we can find each other. I can connect you to the next person, so forth and so on. So being able to have those connections and networks will remain true in your pursuit to, uh, to have the ethical data set. Okay, excellent. Um, so we don't have open questions, but I have a question for you. So you presented um, so much work that you've done on the um, Chicago um, youth study. Um, and so what are the next steps with that? Are, is that still an area of active investigation for you? Yeah, I really appreciate that question. So um, funding a study to intervene in gun violence that might start on social media is really hard and never happened for me um, for lots of good reasons. They're just, it's fraught with ethical challenges. But again, what I learned by engaging more reflexive questions and by digging deeper in the data is that yeah, that's not really the issue. 
But I found is that there were lots of young people that were expressing trauma and grief and loss, and that that would be a predictor for aggression and threatening language in the future. And we found that to be the case within the two-day window in Chicago. And so we have now redirected our work to focus on aggression and loss, and then that led to funding. And so we uh, most recently were awarded NSF grant to study what happens after trauma is posted online. And so that's a collaboration between a computer scientist and a linguist. And we created um, a web-based platform to collect digital um, diaries from Black Harlem, Black New York City residents. Um, and we will use these tools, both so social work thinking, annotation, computational methods, um, um, and linguistic methods to study the patterns of communication with the goal of being able to identify digital signals of grief and trauma on social media that we can then train the next cadre of social workers to understand and to um, include in their either macro or uh, micro work. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> Thank and, you. And also, people say that NSF doesn't fund schools of social work, so obviously that's not true. But the, the, the trick is to collaborate with computer scientists okay. and, and linguists. <laughs> I've seen you posting uh, on social media about, I guess you call it a black grief study. Yes, that's the black but grief that's, study. That's what you're describing, that you're going, can you just tell us again in a nutshell what the aims of that study are? It sounds so interesting. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't think we know a lot about black grief. And I think that what we understand about grief is oftentimes mapped onto the black experience. What we are seeing, particularly in this area of co-occurring pandemics of COVID-19 and anti-black racism, is a, is, is a use of social media as a way to articulate grief. And sometimes grief may come in the, in the form of joy, or it may come in the form of anger, and it may come in the form of lyrics and but being able to understand that understand the patterns of grief and being able to connect individuals to grief that is expressed online is a, um as a way of supporting folks i think it's critically important and so we want to use these digital tools to be able to support grief that may be happening in both physical and digital spaces um would it be fair to say that you started with this question about violence in chicago and that that led you to the under understanding of grief as an underpinning of violence 100 percent grief was not was not something that i was studying not something that i was interested in it was something that was in the data that kept coming up over and over again i just want to say i feel emotional as i think about the young people in your study and um, the world that we've created for them i'm sure the work is challenging at times for your team it is and it also speaks to why like doing this work cannot happen in a vacuum that we also need to have a set of processes where we, where we keep each other together, where we process uh, what we see. Um, so our students in the lab are very close. They connect on these topics. Uh, they process these topics together. We offer opportunities for them to get support if needed. They can come out of a you know annotation if they need to as well because it's you know re reviewing deep pain of young people. Um, over and over again can be really hard. Um, and so we want to make sure that folks have enough support to get through that too. Right. Yeah, I feel it even just in the talk today. Um, even, you know, the NYCHA study that you described, you know, it's a hard environment to live in and a frustrating environment to live in sometimes. And, and yes, and there is so much hope. Um, I think one of the things that we want to make clear to the new mayor is that um, New York City residents care about their communities, they care about their safety, they have ideas about what that can look like, that they should not be shut out of those communications, they should be leading those conversations. We have lots of examples. We have, you know, I'm out of Brownsville a lot of community members push back against facial recognition systems in their community and won, right? And so by being able to convene people in space to leverage these really brilliant ideas that come out of social media can lead to transformational social change. But again, if we don't see those individuals as being experts, if we don't put resources behind it, if we don't value that expertise, this is not gonna go anywhere. Um, and so being, a, and I think this, this, this is the trend, the need for the translational piece is that we have to be able to take the, what we learn computationally and craft in the way that it becomes a, a new policy decision or a new convening of sorts that gets these ideas out there in a, in a quicker way as well. 
to sort of underscoring the point that uh, it's so important to have community involvement and uh, consistent with the idea, nothing about us without us um, at every level of this type of research, which it can be expensive and time consuming and labor intensive, but you're saying is absolutely critical to the work. I believe so. We have a question that I'll take because you can't speak to this, which is how will the Senate work towards and demonstrate social equity in terms of inclusion of BIPOC scholars on the team? So right now our team is our uh, our launch committee, our scientific advisory board that Dr. Uh, Dean Guterman described. I am the interim director. Um, we are going to be searching for um, an endowed uh, professor in data science for NYU um, who will, either lead or lead with me, the center, that will be a decision that the silver community makes and certainly could be a BIPOC person. And we'll be mindful of uh, BIPOC inclusion as we grow the center. So thank you for that question, so important. Okay, last call for questions. And it, um, if we don't have any more, we'll we'll thank um, Dr. Patton. Uh, well, we'll thank Amanda Ritchie for her able stewardship and organization of this event. So, you know, uh, it's a lot of work. So thank you so much, much appreciated. And Dr. Patton, thank you so much for sharing your insights, all your research studies, your observations, and um, your vision for the future of this this new field. We really appreciate it. Thank yeah, th thank you so much for jumpstarting our conversation and, and helping us dive into this, this uh, field. And, and thank you for your leadership in this field too, Desmond. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so great to be with you all. And everyone, please stay in touch with us in the ways that um, Amanda Ritchie put in the chat. All right, take care, everyone. Be well. Thank you so much for thank coming. Bye-bye. So Bye.